was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. I love the Christ tonight on Calvary, for He washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to say. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we come before you this morning. God, uh, we have some folks that uh, need your prayer. Uh, Miss Sheila, uh, God, she's kind of down with the, uh, the ugly grubbies, Lord, and uh, she needs your help. And I pray that uh, you'll lift her up and, uh, and God, uh, make this uh, uh, thing that's afflicted her uh, go away. And Lord, we pray for Miss Carol. Uh, she's in the emergency room. Thank God that uh, uh, they're taking care of her, Lord. The doctors are, are doing tests on her. And I pray that they'll find out exactly what transpired and how to help this dear lady. Uh, Lord, uh, she's a dear saint of God. Um, she loves you, Lord. Um, and uh, God, it, every day can get a struggle for her. And Lord, uh, I, I'm, her family needs help, God. Uh, Lord, maybe they need to make some big, uh, hard decisions. And I pray you help them with that. Lord, and, and there's other people. God, folks, we pray for all the time. Martha Jean and, and uh, Lord D and Anise. And, and Lord, uh, we need to pray for everybody else too, Lord. Uh, God, um, I pray you help our country. And God, uh, help Christian people uh, come to church and rally around the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, help us to make a difference here in Pensacola. God bless us now as we sing your praises and we hear your word preached. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all may be saved.
preacher, brother. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be here. I spent so much time wrestling with my computer this week. I didn't think I was going to have anything really to preach. Uh, I finally managed to cobble out some outlines and things. And uh, last night they really weren't finished very well. I got up this morning and I was able to finish them. But uh, I, I usually don't come in under the wire that way. So please pray for me this morning. Let's turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now, let me ask, when you get there, I'll, I'll let you get there. And then, then I got a question to ask you. Psalm 22. Now, you should recognize this psalm. The first verse is a quotation that Jesus said on the cross. If I were to ask, anybody can answer, I don't care, what this psalm was about, what would you say? Cry of anguish, all right. It's a prophecy of some sort. I'm sure you've heard it preached or referred to. Brother Vic, what do you think this psalm's about? Jesus on the cross, okay? Most of the time when you hear this preached, you will hear about Jesus on the cross. And it's a, it's a prophetical reference to the cross of Calvary. <laughs> Up until a point. You get to verse number 21. It says, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. So the first 21 verses are about the cross, a prophecy of what Jesus felt and experienced on the cross. Huh. But what about the rest of it? I've never heard anybody preach the rest of this psalm. So this morning, we're going to look at the other half of Psalm 22. Look at verse 22. The Bible says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. So this is the guy who died on the cross. He's saying this to God. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Hallelujah. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise God, the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All ye that... Be fat upon the earth shall eat. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of us need to pick that up as a live verse. Amen. And worship. All they that go down into the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. And it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Heavenly Father, help us now as we study the other half of this psalm. And God, it's surprising what it says. Help us to take note of it and help us to take heed of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, did you notice that this had nothing to do with the cross or prophecy of the cross? This is somebody that's been prophesied on the cross in the first 21 verses of this psalm. All of a sudden he's saying some other things. This same man that was on the cross. 
interesting, isn't it? Let's, let's look at three things. First of all, this talks about the, the early church. This talks about the early church. I want you to notice that in uh, verse 29, it talks about uh, um, they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship, and they shall go down unto the dust, shall bow before him, and none shall keep his own soul. Uh, a seed shall serve him, and shall be accounted uh, to the Lord for a generation. This is talking about the church age. The church age went from an Old Testament setup where you had to have faith in God, but there was no being born again. There was no new creature. There was no Jesus coming inside your heart and staying there. But when we got to the New Testament, you had to be born again. You had to be saved. And I, I want you to notice that there's three groups in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10.32 says, Neither give offense, uh, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Three groups, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God. And the early church had to do with those three things. First of all, it was about the Jews. Look in verse 22 there. Um, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Well, who was Christ's brethren? The Jews. He was a Jewish carpenter. From Nazareth, uh, in the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee? Well, that's the congregation of the nation of Israel. Uh, if you want to know who that is, ye that fear the Lord, praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. It's very clear that in the early New Testament, in the book of Acts, we go from the Jews to the Gentiles. We're going from the Old Testament in the book of Matthew to the New Testament. Then when we finally get to the church, we're going from a Jewish church to a mostly Gentile church. That's the history of the book of Acts. You want to explain all the tongues and all the miracles and all that stuff in there? Uh, the Jews require a sign. The Gentiles don't. We got us a book. And Jesus declared himself to the Jews all through the Gospels. And then the apostles, they preached to the Jews in the book of Acts. Uh, but then there came a guy along, his name was Paul. And he was called to something different. The rest of the book of Acts is about him and his travels and what he does. In verse 25 there in Psalm 22, it says, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Jesus wants to see his own brother and say, he came as the Jewish Messiah. We forget that. We think Jesus is ours. Oh, Jesus is ours, all right, but only because the first group he was offered to really didn't want him. Thank the Lord. And now people in Europe and Africa and India and Asia and Oh. Australia and South America, North America, the Eskimos up in the Arctic Circle, everybody has a chance to, to get in. Amen. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, it's interesting. We have street preachers here in Pensacola. And they've never been particularly liked by most people. Matter of fact, I had a fellow one time, he said, well, they, they hate me or they wouldn't get up there and preach. No, they're not doing it out of hate. They're doing it out of love. They want to spread the gospel. And, and when they go to your door, you won't answer the door and you won't take a track if they stand on, in front of Walmart and they run them off. So really, there's no alternative to stand on the corner and preach as the car goes by. Or find you a crowd and preach to it. That's the way the New Testament did it. And they did it to the Jew first. Everywhere that the apostles went in every town. Even Paul did it that way. He'd go to the synagogue and he'd preach. And boy, he'd stir up the trouble. Romans 10. This is the part that's good. Romans 10 verse 12. says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. What God did is he put everybody on a level playing field. He said, okay, I've got the chosen people over here, but I'm going to put them as far as the being 
chosen part on a shelf for a while till I get through with everybody I'm going to get out of the Gentile nations and I'm going to bring them down where everybody's on the same plane. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody needs to be saved and everybody has the same chance of getting saved. That's the story of the New Testament and the early church. That's what the book of Acts goes to. It goes from, uh, you know, they still got a temple and still got sacrifices. And then right after the book of Acts is over, boom, the temple's gone. Look what it says. It says, between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all uh, is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boy, and they got a bunch of them saved in the early church. Everywhere they'd go, they'd, they'd start. And they didn't have just little pe groups of people. They had thousands and hundreds and sometimes tens of thousands. And, and Rome, looked, you know, Rome looked from its great imperial uh, you know, uh, sanctuary of Rome and they looked out on its empire and all of a sudden they started seeing something that was very disturbing. All of a sudden you had these people coming together and they were coming together for one idea and, uh, and one name and to have one purpose. That always worries dictatorships. It always does. It always does. So you see very clearly that this, it's kind of nice because it talks about the cross and then all of a sudden it talks about what's the results of the cross. Because we'd never have salvation. We'd never have a, a, a Jewish Messiah that was offered to us unless he went and died on the cross. Amen. Secondly, it talks about the faith at his coming. Now God never in the Bible tells us exactly how long the church age is going to be. So far it's been, uh, well it's almost been 2,000 years. Since Jesus stepped out of Nazareth and started preaching, uh, in another uh, 11 years, we're going to hit that 2,000 mark of when Jesus started preaching. And then three years after that, we're going to hit the, the mark of when he died on the cross. I don't know how long it's going to be. I'm not suggesting he's going to come when that's over with. All I'm suggesting is, is we have to remain faithful. We have to look for him every day. And believe me, I look for him every day. Verse 30 and 31. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. You know what the Bible calls being born again? Re- generation. Goinky dinky, huh? They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. That last verse is about his righteousness given to people by faith. That's the gospel message. Look, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to keep it. You get his righteousness. He's the one that's done this. And the first part of the psalm, we learn what he did. He died on the cross and he suffered on the cross. Why did he do that? He did that as a substitute for you and for me so that we could take his righteousness and we could let we could be his seed. We could be his sons and daughters. We could be part of the family of God. Oh, what a blessing. And whether it's 2,000 years or 3,000 years, at the end of the church age, he's going to find somebody there that believes in him. Now, it's a, a, disturbing, uh, a disturbing statistic has come to light. Uh, it was several days ago, I saw this on the Newsmax uh, website. It reports that the majority of professing Christians, there's they take a poll, they say, are you Christian or are you not? Uh, we still have more Christians than not, just barely. Okay? Half the population is pagan in America. But the majority of the professing Christians that say, I'm a Christian, no longer attend church services, and a majority of them don't even belong to any church. That should disturb you very greatly. It's the disintegration of the Christian faith. 
I don't know how missionaries are going to stay on the field if no one's there to support them. Why should they come to church? They can just tune in on their TV and they can get any kind of preaching from any kind of book they want. And nobody passes the offering plate. They ought to love our church. We never pass the offering plate. In fact, you come here more than nine times out of ten, they come two or three times and they look around and finally they either come to me or some one of the men of the church that says, when do you take offerings around here? And we say, there's a box. And they say, oh yeah, I saw that box. Well, if you want to give, give. If you don't, well, that's up to God. God takes good care of us around here, don't he? Amen. Don't he? 1 Corinthians 15, 23 it talks, about, it talks about the end time. It says, but every man, that's Christian Christians, uh, and it's, it, it, when it says man, it's talking about a man and a woman and his children that's saved. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Look, Christ had to die on the cross. They had to bury him. Why'd they have to bury him? They had to bury him so you knew he was dead. That's why he stayed in the grave. And it wasn't Friday afternoon to Sunday morning. It was three days and three nights. Count them. Day one, day two, day three. Night one, night two, and night three. Six different distinct time periods. Three daylight, three nighttime periods. Three days and three nights. Look, it's possible for someone to lose consciousness and maybe not even hardly breathe so you'd think they was dead. And back in the old days that they'd bury people in coffins and they'd, they'd put little ropes with bells on it before they threw the dirt on there because sometimes they buried a live person. And you could stay unconscious for you know, Friday night to Sunday morning maybe, but it's, you put a guy in a tomb for three days and three nights, he did. He did like, like a bug did. He did. That's why they put him in the grave. But then on that glorious morning, he came up from the grave. <laughs> he pushed that old stone away. He knocked them old soldiers out with the power of probably his words. And... He walked upon the earth again alive. And one day, he's going to push that old gravestone of your loved ones aside. He, that dirt's going to come apart. And that, that dead Christian is going to come up from that grave. And we're going to go be with Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 Wherefore... We would come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Look, Paul says, I want to come and I want to preach to you. But look, don't lose hope. If I, if I don't get back to preach to you, one of these days we're going to have a meeting up in heaven. We have all kinds of songs in the hymn book about meeting in heaven. Meet me there, meet me there. Where the sins of life will meet me there. I can't wait. I can't wait. First John 2.28 And now, little children, I don't feel like a little child, but the Bible says I'm a little child. Abide in him that when he shall appear... We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him as coming. He said, look, Jesus is coming. And, and I worry about those people that don't go to church and don't belong to church. How in the world are they going to know how to live? They don't know they're going to give an account before the Lord. None of them TV preachers ever preach on that. You ever wondered about that? They never preach on those kind of things. Huh, that's not a good way to get ratings. You look at my old YouTube channel. Oh, I have a few. I try to put interesting titles on the sermon so people will look at them. But most of my sermons, I may get two, three, four. Uh, the best one I got is like 42. That ain't much in YouTube land. Some of these things, you know, it's thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have looked at them. Well, I'm, I, 
I'm never going to get that. I'm a Bible preacher and I insult people and I preach the truth from the Bible and a lot of people just don't like the truth. Or they would come to church and join a church. Early church age is mentioned in this psalm. The faith at his coming is mentioned in this psalm. And finally, this is the theme of the whole Bible, his coming kingdom. There's more about the coming kingdom of Christ in the Bible than the virgin birth, even the cross of Calvary, or the salvation of Gentile Christians, if you exclude the Pauline epistles. Most of the Old Testament in type or in prophecy is about the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does the Lord's Prayer say? Thy kingdom come? Well, why do they pray that in that prayer? His kingdom's coming. And the king's going to reign over the kingdom. And that's in this psalm too. Look what it says. Verse 27. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Look, when He comes, they're all going to turn to the Lord. If they don't, boy, they're going to have trouble. We don't have time to go into it this morning. But if you, if you, if you study all those millennial passages, you'll find out one thing. The nations that don't come to Christ, God is not going to make their food grow and is not going to renew their patch of ground till they come and bow their knee. And thank God the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Finally. But you know, there's always some stubborn holdouts. 28. Well, let's finish reading 27. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Well, that's never happened in the church age. That's a future passage, folks. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. I'm glad we, we do have a pretty good governor in Florida. We've had some good governors. But though there's some states, boy, they don't. They're wacky, wacky to bat. Did you know the governor of New York put fighter jets on alert? I guess to shoot at the citizens if they rioted. That was the order that came down. Somebody needs to get rid of that dude. He's dangerous. You're not supposed to shoot at your citizenry. That's not what's supposed to happen. They're supposed to get rid of you, not vice versa. Well, there's two parts to this coming. And there's always been two parts to the coming. And that's where most people break down. They don't see the difference between the rapture and the revelation. They don't see the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. They don't see those two parts. But there are two parts. 2 Timothy 4 1 says, I charge thee before God, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Look, he's going to appear in the sky and we're going to go to heaven, those Christians. Boom. And he's going to judge us up at the judgment seat of Christ. And then, he, boom, he's going to come back with all the armies of heaven and the churches and you know, probably some of the Old Testament people too. And he's going to pounce on Satan, get rid of the Antichrist and set his kingdom up. And he's going to judge him then. He's going to judge him then. And then when all that goes away, he's going to judge everybody. Two parts. Two parts. Two parts. And our future is in there. We get to be part of the future kingdom. Look up 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says. That ye would walk worthy of God. Are you walking worthy of God? Boy, that's a, that's a mouthful. Who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now, all these people that are bringing in the kingdom, they're building... Fa bigger, faster trains and they want cleaner, better energy and, and, and you know, they're going to go colonize the space colonies and all this stuff. They got, the, they got the wrong thing going, folks. They're trying to build the kingdom without the king. You can't build the kingdom without the king. 
And we have been called to the kingdom. Those people that go to the kingdom halls, they're all wet. They're trying to build the kingdom here now. Huh. We don't have to build it. He's going to build it for us. We're just going to help him. What are you going to do? I don't know, all kinds of things probably. You're going to have a glorified body. It don't matter. <laughs> if God wants you to lift a thousand pallets of plywood and bring it over to Yugoslavia somewhere, no problem, God. It's there. You know, that's how powerful you're going to be with a new body. Well, I wish it was today. Amen. Why must the church leave? The church has got to leave. It's got to go. Why must we go? Well, let me say this. The main objective of Satan and his workers in this age, listen, is the breakdown of human society, the human economy, education, and human religion in preparation for the Antichrist. Let me repeat that. In this age, the main objective of Satan and his workers is the breakdown of human society, human economy, education, and human religion in preparation for the Antichrist. The world population at that time must be three things in order for the Antichrist to be successful in his takeover. One, they must be all poverty stricken. They talk about the redistribution of wealth. Well, you do that, you know what you get? Everybody's poor. That's what the devil's wanting. Two, psychologically dependent and uncertain in all aspects of their life. That's what's going on. You watch it. You get average of 20, 30 you know, between 15 and 25 and ask them what in the world's going on in their life and where the, which direction they're headed and they haven't got a clue, none of them. None of them. Thirdly, they are prone to accept any strong leadership who promises help and deliverance out of all their troubles. That's where he wants society to come, where they're begging for somebody to come along and help them and get them out of the mess they're in. The devil creates a mess so he can clean it up. That's the long and short of it. And it's coming. Our society is breaking down. Why would God have us around. Why would the devil attack us? Well, let me say this about the United States. The United States is still the strongest country in the world that is based on all the opposite conditions I just talked about. You take all those things and turn them around and look at the opposite, that's what the United States stands for. Oh, somebody don't like it. And they're trying to grind it now. You say, what about those people over in Asia? They're puppets. They're puppets. There was a political cartoon that appeared on one of the websites that I saw. And it had the president and, and the vice president. And the vice president had her hand a little, a little puppet of the president. And then behind her, there was another uh, superpower that had a hand in her. She was a puppet. But if the cartoon had been true, you'd seen another person manipulating the strings and that guy was Satan. The mystery of iniquity has already existed. And I want to say this, folks. Are you ready to go? If I was you, I'd get ready to go. It may be at morn when the day is awaking, when sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. It may be at midday. It may be at twilight. It may be perchance in the blackness of midnight 
will burst into light in the blaze of His glory when Jesus receives His own. While hosts cry Hosanna from heaven descending, with glorified saints and the angels attending, with grace on His brow, like a halo of glory, will Jesus receive His own. O oh, joy, O oh, delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying. Caught up through the clouds with our Lord in the glory. When Jesus receives his own. Oh Lord Jesus. How long, how long. Ere we shout the glad song. Christ returneth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready? Are you ready? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Well, there's really no kind of invitation to give a sermon like this. Go home and be ready. <laughs> Go home and be ready. You say things are a mess at home. We got this and that and the other. Yeah. That's the trick of Christianity nowadays. Through all the junk that this world puts us through, we got to stay ready. So how do I do it? You get on your knees and pray. Say, Lord, help me. <laughs> I prayed a lot about computers this week. Uh, Y'all family's going to pray a lot about Miss Carol. You're going to be praying about your leg still. You're going to be praying about Miss Barbara. You're going to be praying about... Your kids and I, I mean, we all got the things that we pray about. Let's lift each other up. Let's be ready, because one day, and I believe this with all my heart, I have not lost faith in the second coming. Amen. That that trump's going to sound, and he's going to appear on that cloud with grace on his brow, like a halo of glory, and he's going to receive us, his own. I'm going to get, and forever be with the Lord, the Bible says. Oh, I can't wait. Heavenly Father, please come back this morning. I miss you, God. I miss humble people. God, frankly, this planet stinks. But God, you got us here to do a job. And while we're here, have us to occupy. Give us the strength that we need. God, give us the words to say. Help us to find those people with a little bit of faith in their heart. All it takes is a grain of mustard seed, God. So help us. Help us, Lord. God, please be with our congregation. God, uh, I pray you just uh, put a wall of protection around each one of them and help them, God, through the trials and tribulations and things they got to go through. God, um, I know you're able and I know you love us. And God, help us to remember that love. This psalm said there's people that remember. God, we need to remember what you did for us and what you do for us. And, you're coming to get us. Lord, thank you for Psalm 22. Thank you that you suffered on the cross. God, thank you for your love. You showed us your love and you do so every time we look around, God. Bless us now as we go our way. Bring us back this evening to hear the preaching of the word of God. And I pray you bless us in Jesus' name we Amen.